in this in this class we are going to to talk about two things one quickly and the other not so quickly uh, the quick thing is about a short introduction to evaluations in general which will be of course useful for the heuristic evaluation that will be the second thing we are going to talk today and also useful for another evaluation we will meet uh, towards the end of the course that would be the usability testing and that would be part also of assignment five uh, but today we covered a short introduction evaluation and of longer a discussion about heuristic evaluation and then monday we will do next class we will do an exercise on heuristic evaluation before you will do the heuristic evaluation on another group prototypes so where we are in the path uh, the last things we we covered was prototypes low fidelity prototypes but just before we talk about principles we talk about theories and we will talk about guidelines in in a few weeks um, and i show you this this picture already when we talk about principles uh, saying that we had uh, document processes theories principle are one element fundamental element of building good user interface and another was about experiments evaluation etc for which the expert review which is the heuristic evaluation which is the heuristic evaluation is one kind of expert review is another factor mm -hmm. so we talk already about generating design solution using theories and principle especially principle now we move for a moment on the other side that is using some principles in a way to perform evaluation that is again the expert review and is the heuristic evaluation in the evaluating design we will also have usability testing that we will meet again towards the end of the course and control experiments that instead we won't cover in the course um, so evaluation the goal of evaluation is testing the usability functionality and acceptability of an interactive system and this is true in general is not only related to the heuristic evaluation but it's about evaluation in general so this of course is related to the specific design stage in which we are of course in a low fidelity prototype as yours we cannot evaluate for instance colors because we don't have them uh, we cannot evaluate maybe the full complete real world functionality of a system because we don't have it yet and similarly in final system we can evaluate these things but we can lose control or can lose the outlook on things that instead are more evident on a low fidelity prototype etc and evaluation so is according to the design stage is according to the goal that we have is according to the population the users we are referring to and it should be alongside various usability dimension and it can include the evaluation different techniques but the goal evaluation is in this process to identify and correct issues as soon as possible mm? earlier in the process as possible to avoid going with a product with a system let's say in the world with significant issues so the bet the fur before we solve these issues the better for the later and also less time is wasted later on uh, so just a reminder usability uh, as various dimension we, we we met them already at the beginning of the course and for usability we can use this definition that say that usability is how well user can use the system functionality and then there are various dimension usefulness is one of them learnability is one of them memorability effectiveness efficiency visibility errors and satisfaction are all dimension that are part of usability and we met some of them in the principle 
So errors is something we mentioned in principles, visibility is something we mentioned in the principles, etc. Uh, functionality instead, since evaluation, is about assessing the usability, functionality and acceptability of the system. Functionality means that the system functionality should fit the user needs, the user requirements and enable people to perform their task in their own idea and mental model. And functionality can be tested in different way. Here there are two examples, uh, including are the functionality needed functionality available in the system and they are clearly reachable and used and usable by the user and they match the user expectation or not. Um, and functionality evaluation could also include measuring the user performance within the system. We mentioned uh, one, quickly one theory about it, about measuring times, etc. So this could also be that I want to measure how long it takes to complete a functionality, to do an action in the application in seconds or milliseconds. So it can perform like performances of the system to complete a task. Uh, acceptability means uh, a perception of a system before the use of the system itself. While acceptance is the perception of the system by, from a person after using the system. So acceptability is something that comes first, comes before, it's formed the impression of the person, and acceptance is that something that the person forms later on, after have used the system. Um, good user interface design, including applying the principle we have seen, can make a product easy to understand and use, which will result in a greater user acceptance, not necessarily acceptability. Uh, testing instead acceptability means evaluating the enjoyment and the emotional response to a system. And this is particularly true for systems that are uh, aimed for leisure or entertainment, and not, of course, as less for uh, like serious system, like you know, a spreadsheet or a system for uh, handling student and courses that are not uh, entertainment related. So testing for accessibility means measuring satisfaction and comfort and also identifying areas of the design that overloads the user. So for instance, if you have a recommender system of movies or songs, etc., and this recommender produces in the home page hundreds of suggestions that is overloading the person because there are too many suggestions that makes no sense for having a suggestion in the first place, because it's a higher number of suggestions that the user needs to scroll and evaluate on their own. Mm -hmm. uh, so in this case, that could be an area of a design that could, um, could be worked on, since overloading means reducing, in this case, uh, acceptabilities. In general, there are many evaluation approaches. Uh, according to different factors, evaluation uh, can take place in different physical places. It can happen in the lab or it can happen in the field. Uh, in the lab means that you get people in a room that you sort of control and uh, have the person try test your system, your design, etc. Uh, this could have some, let's say, advantages and disadvantages or in any case, things to keep in mind. So, of course, an uh, in the lab evaluation is useful for simulating dangerous environment. If you have to do an interface for an astronaut, you cannot test it in the wild, in the space. You have to test it in the lab before, and then maybe you can move it at a certain point in the in the field. Uh, is very suitable for specific tasks within a system, but in the other case, it lacks of context because it's not immersed in the people's life, in the daily activities. Uh, you can have unnatural situation that can lead to biases in responses, in action, and it can also be not suitable for all the tasks, for all the context. We exemplified if, if it's raining, you need to test your application. In that context, you cannot simulate rain in a controlled environment in the lab. Uh, 
In the lab, approaches are typically adopted in the early stage of design, especially to compare multiple alternatives before reaching the stage in which you are ready to do something in the real world. Um, field study, on the other side, means bringing the system, the, the, the product, the application outside of a room in the real, in the end of the user for longer period of time and as, as similar to the other as some advantages and disadvantages so of course there is the real context and people are using it in their natural environment in their daily life etc on the other side you have low degree of control so you cannot make all the experience identical across users because you cannot control the environment maybe one person is using it on a bus the other one is using a train the other one is using it at home so you don't have control on what's going on in the environment uh, it have, in a sense, an higher cost. You need a working implementation, an implementation that can work in a stable way for weeks, months, not just for three hours. And of course, the duration is longer, so you have results only after a certain amount of time, and not immediately like in, a, uh, in the lab test. Uh, evaluation can also be based on expert evaluation or not. Heuristic evaluation is based on expert evaluation. It's one of the methods, the last in, this, in the first bullet point. Um, but there are other expert evaluation, like review methods, analytic methods. There is some expert that is helping, giving feedback, etc. Uh, the expert evaluation, again, has some advantages and disadvantages. It can be used at any stage of the development process. It's typically quicker than doing an evaluation with a real user and it's also cheap hmm? because it doesn't require many people just need a few experts of the domain of the user interface of principle etc and you get feedback from them um, however it does not really assess the actual in the wild the use of the system it's just an evaluation from experts that are expert of user interface of interactive system of technology and not expert on the domain in which the activities is going on for instance the medical activity etc uh, if instead involve users you can have multiple methods including the observational methods contextual inquiries interviews observation this can be used for need finding but it can also be used for um, seeing how people use a product a system and then learn something from that uh, that could be your system, it could be another system, but you still learn something on that. Or it could be experimental methods uh, in which you set up something and try something, your system, in a more systematic way. Um, and, and this experimental method could be, let's say, simpler, uh, like disability testing, or more statistically driven, research driven in a way in which you formulate an hypothesis and you want to validate that hypothesis in a in a way that is statistically uh, valid and significant across um, a comparison with others that is a controlled experiment mm -hmm. and of course they require more time in this case to be designed and analyzed because many things can can go wrong and many things can um, can be taken into consideration uh, there is also uh, some kind of automated evaluation in which you can perform some simulations or software measure testing uh, a, a software engineer is is a way of automating evaluation some part of software testing user interface exists as well and this is good for formal evaluation with models formulas and especially for low level issues like adherence to specific um, guidelines etc so this is the overview of uh, evaluation heuristic evaluation is one kind of expert evaluation is one kind of design critique and this is in a way the formal way um, of what we did during the course we teacher did during the course you had some you did something you came to us we gave you feedback in class in the lab in the feedback session and this is we criticize, in a way, your design, and we criticize not out of, according to me, 
but according to principle, to experience, etc. So in a way, we act as the expert that give you some feedback in an informal, unstructured way. A heuristic evaluation builds on that same idea. There are experts that can give you, can criticize a specific design and um, according to some principles, some criteria, some guidelines so that you can build on it and fix things on, on it. Today is really difficult because there are a lot of people talking also right now. So if you are not really interested, instead of staying here and talking, there are plenty of space outside of this room. But if you stay here, I'm asking you to pay attention or at least fake it to pay attention. So if someone needs to leave, please, it's not a problem. It's better for, for everybody, including me. No, no one? Okay. So, heuristic evaluation, but feel free anytime um, to leave. So, heuristic evaluation, that's the, the idea. You have experts that check potential issues on your design. Um, and in this course, for your project, you will be the experts that will evaluate and critique other students' projects. So when it's design critique in general or heuristic evaluation useful, it's um, useful before user testing, testing with real users, because it saves effort, solves some easy to solve problem, and leave also user testing for bigger, more significant issues. Uh, it's also useful before redesigning. If you have something, you decide if you want to redesign it partially or not, that could be useful because it, it helps you to identify the good parts to the interface of the system to keep and the one to remove or redesign. And also it's useful for generate evidence, not opinions, not subjective ideas, but evidence on problem that maybe are known or suspected, maybe are known because there are complaints for clients, because you notice something that is not working, etc. So you move from impression to evidence, something that can be justified in multiple ways, including in a company, for instance. And it's also useful before the release of the final version, the final product, in terms of polishing and smoothing the user interface and the system. So heuristic evaluation is a method that was uh, invented in 1994 by this person, Jacob Nielsen, that works with uh, Norman that we, met, that we met already. And it's a method of design critique, of expert evaluation, that is structured. It's structured meaning that it has specific rules and it has specific processes and define also, Nielsen defined also specific heuristics to be used. So it's structured, it uses a simple and general heuristics. Heuristics are principles, in a way. Uh, it is something that can be executed by a small number of experts. And Nielsen did some experiment, identified that an optimal number is three to five people. So not a huge number of people. It is suitable for any stage of the design. It could be a sketch, it could be a paper prototype, it could be a final product. Uh, and the goal is to find a usability problem before they are significant, before they are impactful in a negative way. Uh, it was popularized in 1994 as discount usability because before heuristic evaluation in the industry, the approach was doing usability testing and usability testing maybe required 20 people, 20 target users of your population, 30, and you need to set up an environment simulating all the things and you need to have something at a certain level of accuracy and working level to make it. So it's, it's much more complex and expensive in multiple ways, including times. So it takes an arm of discount usability because in this case, you have three, five people that are experts or don't need much help or input from you and they can produce some results already in a, 
shorter time and also spending less in general. Mm -hmm. So what is a heuristic? I told you the heuristic is a sort of principle, is a guideline or a certain or general principle or a rule of thumb that can guide a decided decision or be used to critique a decision that was made. Mm -hmm. So when we you created the paper prototype, um, I, we suggested you to use the principle to guide the design of that. In this sense, an heuristic is a principle that guides the design decision. Now we are doing the opposite. We are using some principle different from the others to critique the decision that you already made, that someone already made, according to some principle, according to their experience, according to many things. Uh, so the basic idea is this. You define or get access to a set of heuristics or principle. You give those heuristics to a group of experts. Each expert will use the heuristic to... You also give the, the user interface to this expert. And each expert will use the heuristics for looking for problem at the design of the user interface. Each expert work alone, independently, so that they can find different problem. And at the end, they meet together, communicate, share the funding, and agree on the severity of their problem. And what they found is called violations. So violation to the heuristics. And these are passed to the design team, to the people who created the user interface, to either fix problem, to discuss or to redesign a part of an entire part, uh, an entire user interface. It depends how critical these violations are. Mm -hmm. So this is the basic idea. Uh, since it all starts with heuristics, defining heuristics, Nielsen proposes 10 heuristics to be used mm -hmm. in their process. Uh, they are good at finding most general purpose in a way design problem and they are of course inspired and connected by the principle we already discussed uh, these heuristics are not the only one that can be used the process is free you can, you're free to generate new heuristics in a general process and or use different heuristics also different heuristics can be used in a specific context specific application domain or exist for instance exist heuristics for human AI interaction that apply only when you have AI in uh, an interface or you have heuristics for um, vocal system that of course apply only in that context and only in the others so Nielsen heuristics are the general one that apply across multiple um, cases but in other domain some new heuristics can be defined can be added some can be ignored etc so I'm going today to present the 10, let's say, original heuristics, and we are going to use, you are going to use, those same 10 heuristics in uh, the lab as well, even if other heuristics can, can exist or can be defined. So which are the phases of a heuristic evaluation? So uh, first of all, you welcome the expert and you give the expert, the single expert, the evaluator, information about the domain and the context they need to be evaluated. So this is a mobile application, this is a desktop application, this is a website, and this is for children, this is for school, this is some contextual information to give information about what's going on there, what's the purpose of the application, the user interface that they are going to evaluate. Um, then each expert do the evaluation, again individually, checking if the design that they have in front of them uh, violates page by page the heuristics or not, and taking notes which heuristics is violated and when and where in the application. Then it gives a rating of severity. Mm? So, these things violate heuristic number one, but is not so critical. It's something nice to have, but it's not really, really, really critical. Instead, this other thing is hugely important and needs to be fixed as soon as possible because it's a huge usability problem. And it still violates the same heuristic as before, but it's a different severity. 
So first of all, expert give a severity rating individually, and then they aggregate. They come together and try to find consensus in some way on the severity. Hmm? So let's make an example. I found ovulation on the heuristic number one, another expert find a uh, the same violation on the same heuristic, on the same portion of the user interface, let's say on the navigation bar of the application, but I gave high severity and the other person gave a low severity of that. And we need to communicate this to the design team so that they can know how to proceed. And we need to agree among the two of us if it's high severity or it's low severity. And we need to find a way to find consensus to give one single output to the design team so that they can, um, they can rely on the expert guidance to proceed. Uh, then, fourth step, there is a debriefing mm, in which they review with the design team the results of the, uh, of the evaluation and the design team can ask clarification on something they noted or not. Uh, so, step number one. You give context to, to the evaluator about what, what they are looking for at. So it's a mobile application for teachers and children. In, hmm? So the solution in your case uh, and your domain in your case, in the case of the project. And then you define a set of tasks and give them to the evaluator. Hmm? That in this case are by chance the same three tasks you already have. So you give some information to the evaluators, the, con the domain, um, in your case, the solution you created, and your three tasks. These are the information you give to the evaluator. And then for each task, the evaluator should step through the design user interface several times and expect the user interface element of all the page that is of the screen that is in front of him. That could be on the real design, that could be on the preliminary prototype, it doesn't matter, the same process apply. At each step, the evaluator, the expert, check the design according to each of the heuristics. As in general, there are at least two steps. The first one is for getting a general feeling of the interaction flow, the general scope, how things are put together. And the second step, third, fourth, five, fifth, etc. if needed, focus instead on specific user interface element, like this button here in the top left corner, this navigation bar, this arrow here, this picture here, this text there, etc. Knowing already where they fit in the general picture because they experience the, the entire flow already once. And the evaluator uses the heuristics as a reminder to f of things to look for. Hmm? So if there is an heuristic about visibility or consistency and you use search on page one and find for the same button on page four, that is something that could be uh, noted as a violation of a uh, heuristic. Maybe it's a simple one, not high severity, but it's something that can happen. So this violation can happen across pages or within the same page. And again, these heuristics are a reminder to things to look for, but if the expert notice other problem that doesn't fit well within one specific heuristic, they can also report other problem as non-heuristic issues, like it's a generic 11th, everything else heuristics. So this is what happened during the process, and then uh, the evaluator record or write the comments. Hmm? Could be an observer, could be the same evaluator that takes note on what's going on. Um, the observer, if present, might provide a clarification, not about how the interface work, but, how, but about the domain. Hmm? So if there is maybe a specific term that the evaluator doesn't know, maybe the evaluator can ask what the meaning of this specific strange term, and the observer can say, well, this term means X, and this is a common term in the domain you are exploring, let's say the medical domain or lawyer domains. Hmm? There could be specific term that evaluator that is an expert of usability of user interface doesn't know. Hmm? Uh, 
uh, but is normal, common in the domain of the application. Uh, I use a bit of um, heuristic evaluation testing uh, lasts normally between one to two hours. It depends how big is the, the prototype. Uh, and each evaluator at the end provides a list of usability problem, the violation of the heuristics, indicating which heuristic has been violated, where, page one, button on top left corner, or page one, button on top left corner, and page four, button in another place of the page, and why. So this is a violation. It impacts this part of user interface, and it's a violation because hmm? the three information, not in other subjective comments, not is, I don't like the color, hmm? I don't like the, the wording, but is referencing to a noun principle that is the heuristic. And each problem is, of course, reported separately in detail by each expert. As we're mentioning, problem can be found in multiple places across the interface, can be found in a single location in the user interface. There is one problem on page three in that corner. Could be about two or more locations that needs to be compared, again, the button search at a certain point becomes find. That is a simple example of two locations that exhibit the same problem or that are part of a single problem. Uh, that could be a problem with the overall user interface structure. For instance, uh, you have the expert as a web application uh, with navigation of a mobile application. That's a uh, problem with the UI structure because it doesn't fit the standards and the practices of that specific application. Hmm? Or you can have a touch-based application with buttons that are too small, so you cannot really press on them because they are too close one another. So you need to, uh, to fix it because otherwise you, have, you need a mouse to use them, etc. Uh, or something is missing. And Something could be missing because it's a prototype, it's a low fidelity prototype, and not everything is still is already implemented. And, or maybe because something is unimplemented, not by decision, but just forgot to be implemented. Mm? So that could be part of the evaluation. Mm? So even if something is not implemented, it should be reported. And then if it's in the plan to implement them, that's easy to solve because the design team already knows that that will be implemented in a certain way. It's just not working right now according to the specific prototype. Um, so I told you before that we need uh, Nielsen um, defined the number of experts between three and five. Uh, so where this number came from? Hmm? Um, so option one is just trust him and option two ask him to provide details and here there are, I'm going quickly on this, but here there are details. So what Nielsen found with experiment to identify this number was that not evaluator finds all problems. So if you plot here 19 evaluators and the usability problem from easy to hard, you can see that the majority of evaluators find almost all the easy problem. Not all, like evaluator number one, skip this one and this one. But in general, if you have like a few evaluators, you can be more or less um, certain that the easy problem are fixed, are found. Uh, if you look at the hard problem, you see that like this problem was found by one evaluator only. Uh, this instead was found by two evaluators and this is also found by only one evaluator. So no evaluator, doesn't matter how expert they are, finds all the problem in a uh, heuristic evaluation. Even the best one can find a, around one third of the problem, maybe the, the easiest one. Hmm? And most importantly, different evaluators find different problem with, uh, of course, um, an amount of known overlap, as I mentioned before. And then there are evaluators that can find more problems than others according to their sensibility, to their expertise, etc., etc. So 
Why 3 to 5? Because if you, well, plot this number of evaluator across the proportion of problem founds, what you can notice that until 5 evaluator, there is a pretty um, increase hmm? because you move from one evaluator that find 25, 27 percent of problem to five evaluator defined 20, 20, 75, three quarter of problems. So that is a, a, a steep increase. And then after five, you notice that the, the curve tend to flatten hmm? slowly, but tend to flatten. So five evaluator can find 75 percent of the problem. Ten evaluator find 83 percent of the problem, 82 percent of the problem. So you double the evaluators, but you don't double the number of problems that you find. Mm? So where is the trade-off? Mm? So according to Nielsen, between 3 to 5 is, is good enough because you can find 70-75% of the problem. So three-quarter, around three-quarter of the problem with 3 to 5 people. And if you increase the number of people, to, you, you actually never reach 100%. You, at best, can reach something 80%, 90%, etc., but you need maybe 20, 30 evaluators. Mm? So you increase dramatically the number of hours, money, if you need to pay these people, etc., for not getting so many different results. Mm? So if this is one of the evaluation steps that you do, mm? it's, of course, good that you do small, limited number of people evaluation and you repeat it multiple times. So it's better instead of recruiting 15 evaluators and finding in one round 80% of the problem, it's better to recruit five people three times. So that you have version number one evaluated by five people, they found around 75% of the problem, then you fix it and you recruit either five people that will find other 75% of the problems. You fix them and then you recruit other five people and you can find other 75% of the problem. So you recruit and if you need to pay, you pay the same number of people, but you find much more, significantly more issues with the same number of people. And uh, Nielsen also did this uh, graph uh, speaking about cost on a company perspective and uh, putting the benefit in terms of number of problem found with the cost of recruiting evaluator because this is of course there is could be a monetary cost if you need to pay people but there is also time investment because you need to find a room welcome a person give it uh, give this person a, a tool and then wait for the evaluation to end to all the five people to end etc 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 and that is cost in a sense. It's not money cost, it's not a monetary cost, but it's time cost, effort cost, uh, time that you cannot work on the prototype because you are waiting on the project, because you're waiting for the feedback, etc. Mm -hmm. So, and Norma found that the best trade-off between the number of problem usability found and the number of people is these three to five people. Mm -hmm. So three to five people are okay for one round of evaluation and if you have access to more expert you can do multiple rounds of evaluation to get good results uh, this is about the number so about severity rating i told you that um, evaluators also give a rating to the severity of the violation um, so why it's, it's present in the heuristic evaluation process it's present because we need to allocate most resources to fix the most serious problem and not the trivial problem to solve. And so we need to understand from the expert perspective where the effort needs to be put. And severity is a combination of multiple things, according to Nielsen, is a, is a combination of frequency. So how often the problem happens is common um, within the application or is common because it's, it's the task that everybody do. So it's something that will always happen or it's rare. Uh, the impact, if this problem arise, it's easy to overcome or it's difficult and create confusion, create fraction, create calls to the assistance, uh, tickets to be open, etc. And the persistent is one time, it only happened in some specific context or 
it's frequent. Um, and so using these three ideas in mind, um, the expert should define a severity rating for their own heuristic and then find uh, a combined severity rating among all of them. And Nielsen defined four levels of severity rating. Uh, number one is a cosmetic problem only. If you have time, you can fix it. It would be nice to fix it, but it's not important at all. Uh, two is a minor usability problem. So is low priority. It starts to be more significant, but still low priority. Three is a ma major problem. It's important to fix. doesn't matter what you need to do. It's important to fix. It's high priority. And four is the usability catastrophe. So it must be fixed as soon as possible because it's so significant that you cannot move on without solving um, issues at level four. Mm. Um, and then there is this level zero that is no problem. Uh, that is a level that uh, uh, experts use when they find a consensus. Mm. So maybe I say that is um, number one and the other evaluators say, no, but this is actually not an issue. And together we agree that my number one becomes number zero in the final version that we deliver to the, um, to the team, to the design team. Um, so indeed, uh, severity rating from one evaluator are found to be unreliable, mm? but combined they increase uh, reliability. And how to um, do this combined severity rating? There are two common ways. One is consensus. I say one, the other says three, we discuss and we decide that I'm, I'm right and it's one, consensus, or just compute the average. I say one, the other say three, the average is two, and we go on with two, and that's it. Hmm? So these are the two methods that are used for the combined severity rating. In the end, after all this is done, you meet as an expert with the development team, the design team, and you provide information and help them in the discussion, help them in clarifying doubts and, and, and problem to better understand how to fix uh, the issues that uh, arise. And the design team, the development team can also find them, um, can also disagree in a, way, in a way from the expert, maybe for some parts, because maybe they're not implemented, they're not implemented entirely, uh, etc. But this should happen in a very rare case, especially in in a real application, a real world application. Uh, I mentioned user testing as another way of evaluating. So heuristic evaluation is of course faster. Uh, results are pre-interpreted because you have experts that give you information and explain why this is a problem and give you a severity rating. Uh, might generate false positive and might also miss some problem um, that maybe are more related to the usage of the application. User testing that we will see uh, at the end of the course will uh, need you to develop software and prepare for the setup it is by definition more accurate because you have actual user and actual task for their user. Uh, and this is an, uh, another way to uh, alternate and combine, better combine, um, to alternate across the process, so maybe one risk evaluation, one usability testing, and then another risk evaluation, or a couple of risk evaluation, and a couple of user testing, it depends on the stage specifically. Uh, in the course, we will do one round of risk evaluation with you acting as expert, and one round of usability te uh, testing with your actual users, the one you, you met uh, for the need finding, basically. So, which are these 10 heuristics? Uh, the standard heuristics, uh, first of all, there, are, there is a YouTube playlist with videos of like two minutes each that explain and show example of each heuristic. So this is something for you if you need uh, some additional help. And there is also the web page of Nielsen where he presents the 10 heuristics and describe them. Mm -hmm. So we will go through the 10 of them quickly with some examples. So these are the 10 heuristics. Visibility of system status, match between system and the real world, user control and freedom, consistency and standard, error prevention, 
recognition rather than recall. Flexibility and efficiency, aesthetic and minimalistic design help users recognize, diagnose, and recover from errors and help and documentation. And if you remember the principles, some of them overlap with the principles, of course, like the visibility, error prevention, etc. Let's have a look at them. So, visibility of system status means that the system should always keep users informed about what's going on through appropriate feedback within reasonable time. Oh, and in general, these heuristics, hmm? so for instance, the heuristic about aesthetics and minimalistic design could also include colors. But in, in your case, in a low fidelity prototype, you don't have colors. So some of these heuristics might apply more or less according to the stage of prototyping you are, but still they are general enough in this case. So visibility of system status. Uh, these are positive examples of visibility of system status. Hmm? So you are in a form in the first case and you, the application visibly show you at which stage of the process you are. You are not 100%, you are 75% or these things say that is loading hmm? or these things say that the password is strong enough, is giving you feedback on what's going on and how long it takes to complete the process. So if you are in a form, you are page one out of five. So the user knows that there are other four pages in front of them, four other steps to complete. Hmm? So this is visibility of system status. Uh, which feedback we can give? So we can give feedback about time, like execution time for some operation. Uh, we can give feedback about space. It's you are left three megabyte on this uh, cloud storage. You can give feedback about change. Mm -hmm. So it's saved. Warning, you are going to delete this file. Are you sure? Feedback. You can give feedback to action. What's happening? Is running something? Everything is stuck? Or I'm waiting for you to click next, etc. Uh, the feedback about what will happen because of your action, like previewing what is the next step, the next action at this point, and also feedback about the completion. So clarify when a task and operation has been finalized and how long you are from the end of this action. So for time, the rule of thumb is that if the execution time is less than one second, just don't give feedback. Just show the outcome of the operation. If it's around one or two seconds, uh, show feedback that the action is underway, like in progress, loading, but general feedback. If it's more than two or three seconds, then show a progress bar or show something that indicates progress, like 5%, 10%, etc. Et or the estimate time, time of completion is three minutes, etc. So less than one second doesn't matter. Just show the outcome because we don't perceive operations so fast. Um, Around one to second, show some feedback, and then more than three seconds, then show a progress bar, a percentage, something more specific and um, precise, quantitative. Match between system and the real world. The system should speak the user language with word, phrases, and concepts familiar to the user rather than system oriented terms. Follow real world convention, making information appear in natural and logical order. Not totally new things, again, and use familiar metaphors and language. And this is instead a negative example. Uh, look at these things here, the paintbrush. What's the purpose of the paintbrush here, according to you? Change the color of the cells. Copy the format. None of this. Hmm? So this is a negative example because the paintbrush is typically associated with two, these two meaning. One is coloring something or in the spreadsheet ch copying uh, the format of the cell to something else. In this case, it opened a panel for formatting. So fonts, size of the font, uh, background color, but it's a panel in which you have multiple options. It's not just painting. Hmm? 
Uh, so this is a wrong match between the system and the real world hmm? because we are used to see this icon or similar icon for two different things that is not this one hmm? so if we need to guess we will guess wrong in this case this instead are positive matches between the system and the real world uh, so for instance the trash in an operating system is shown as a real recycle bin it's a real trash because we know how it works in the real world so we need to we don't need to think about it we know what's happened when you've trashed something and you empty the trash it's built on a familiar metaphor for everybody uh, the library it's built on icons that are and terms that are familiar to everybody hmm? so movies a tv show that show a tv etc and the, the preview printer show how the paper will look like on sprinted so preview the next action so that you can see okay no but i don't like like this i want less lights per page and you don't need to guess what's going on and what will be the output because you see the output so this is good example of matching between system and real world so exploit in general familiarity files paper folder highlighter icons etc avoid jargon acronyms etc that could be unknowns to your final user pick familiar categories movies um, music etc and familiar choice so explain the meaning of error message in a simple way for the user that is your target population to understand user control and freedom uh, users often choose system function by mistake people make mistakes uh, and they need a clearly marked exit to leave the unwanted state without having to go through an extended dialogue multiple step and support undo and redo of operation so this is a negative example of uh, user control and freedom so violation in a way on the of this heuristic what's the problem here this is what's up they cannot edit the message hmm? so this is a trick not to edit the message hmm? because you don't have that function and so missing that function given this use case is showing that you need a, probably a feature to edit the message so this is a violation of these heuristics these again are instead positive um, examples in which you see again in which stage you are you can move before back and forth and you have suggestion of what to write here and you have the preview as and you if you want to do a calculation there are colors that highlight which is b2 and what is c2 c2 so that you can check that the numbers of cell selected there is actually what you meant to be selected and the operation that you are nine you are there so this is about user control and freedom you can in any way uh, confirm cancel edit so you are multiple option all the option in this way in this specific case to to work on these things uh, so suggestion always provide the back or equivalent button so people are not stuck in a page and always allow user to explore different alternative path except of course for one shot wizard like tutorials etc where there is a specific direction you need to to go there uh, everything number four users should not have to wonder whether different words situation or action means the same thing and form for uh, follow platform con convention so every time i told you there is navigation in this page is a mobile application what is the navigation is a web application the navigation shouldn't be there etc is follow platform convention um so this is um well i don't know if you remember google plus google plus was a social network by google that as many as other google things died um and they didn't want to use like like facebook and so they came up with this plus one to give like and it turns out that people ate it uh, and they prefer like but not because they are very different one another but because people were used to like as a mechanism 
as an action on other platforms. So they are already well-known concept. They don't, they don't need to, to understand something new. And so they preferred the habitual things that was the like instead of the plus one. Uh, this is said are good example from Microsoft uh, of a consistency standard. This is a cross application. Mm -hmm. So if you look Word, Excel, PowerPoint, either the new version or old one, there are things, action, buttons, terminology that are coherent, consistent across the family of product of Microsoft. So that if you know how to insert something in, let's say, Word, you will find the same ribbon and more or less the same icons in PowerPoint. So if you learn to use Word, it will be easy for you learn to use PowerPoint if you never have seen it before. And remember, learnability and memorability are one, is one factor of usability, is one dimension of usability. So this is good across application, not only within application. And we talk a lot about consistency already. Uh, in the previous classes. So suggestion, consistent layout for dialogue and form. So navigation is always in the same place and respect the standard of the platform. Confirmation button are always in the same place. And uh, in the Western world, the okay, yes, the positive on the, uh, on the left than, the, than of, of the cancel, that is on the right. Uh, consistent meaning for okay, cancel, yes, no uh, choices and categories, list of name, geographical uh, region, etc., should be taken from standard vocabulary. Don't reinvent the well. If there is a list of countries, just use that. So that is a standard, uniform way across application to, to do things. Uh, this is an example of um, consistency standard from the Microsoft um, User Experience Guide uh, on buttons so why the first one is bad a pop-up do you want to run this stuff this this software okay cancel why okay cancel is bad they are not a good answer to this question so if someone asks you do you want to run this software you want to reply cancel you will reply probably no so they're not a good answer. So the acceptable one is yes, no, because that's the natural way in which you, you reply with. And there is also a better way. Why this is better? Uh, the buttons are self-informative. You don't need to even read the message. Yes, if you are distracted, etc., the buttons reinforce the concept that one is about running and the other one is about don't run. Mm? So still yes and no, but in a more explicit or reinforcing way. Mm? So it's more coherent and prevents some error and mistakes. Which bring us to five. Even better than good error message is careful design that prevents problem from occurring in the first place. Uh, either eliminate error prone condition or check for them and present user with option before they commit to an action, especially if the action is significant or potentially destructive or you lose information or use data. So suggestion, preventing data loss, frequent save, automatic save, etc. Prevent clutter, or well-organized, clean user interface. Prevent confusing flows, but guide the user across the floor, etc. Prevent bad input. So if I cannot insert a number in a field, then the field should not accept numbers. And if I need to insert a calendar, a date in a field, then the field should only accept calendar dates uh, input. And, but also prevent unnecessary constraint. For instance, if a list, if, if an option has a default value, that is the one, the common value, then that one should be the default one. The common value should be the default one and then people can choose another option. So that they, in most cases, your user will not need to edit that field because you already give them the common uh, answer if available. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is, for instance, a small example of error prevention, a negative example of, of error prevention. So this is an email. Um, what, what does it say? 
please see the touch file where is the attachment There is no attachment. Mm -hmm. So uh, error prevention for uh, Yahoo Mail could be if I write, please see the attached file, and I try to send an email without an attachment, maybe you can tell me, wait, you write attachment, but there is no attachment in the mail. Do you want to send it anyway? And then send, don't send. So that the user, if it's just attached as a verb for whatever reason but you don't need to attach file then the person can say send otherwise you avoid to send an email that say please see the touch file and then there is no attached file and the other person reply the attachment is missing and you reply oops i forgot to touch a file and you attach it and these are interaction that could be emails that could be not sent in this way with checking preventing errors that is with me is this is a very common error uh, these are instead good example of error prevention why the first one is good where is the error prevention here the, the button, is not active, is not active. The button is grayed out that is not active so it, until you write something you cannot share something hmm? And uh, when you start typing something, the button will become enabled. So you prevent the error because you cannot um, submit a form that is empty. So instead of having people, having people pressing update and then showing a pop-up to say error, you should insert some text in it, just prevent this error and uh, enable the button only when the sufficient number of character is inserted in the text. Uh, this is also a good example of error prevention in which the primary action, submit, is clearly identified and significantly different from the secondary action. Mm? So that they, are not they don't look similar, and so there is no way for a user to press one or another if they are close enough, but there is also significant stylistic difference between one and another. Uh, these are other positive examples of error prevention, like uh, the mm, correction if it mistypes something you can google in this case uh, provide me the correct option or the JetBlue uh, a, mm, website when you select um, return date for a flight it doesn't allow you of course to select a return date that is before the start date so if you leave on the 5 you cannot select 6 you cannot select 4 because for, you cannot come back before leaving hmm, in the first place. So these are error prevention in any case. So instead of checking if there is an error, signal the error, etc., in this case, it's better to prevent it. Number six, um, recognition rather than recall. Ma minimize the user memory load. We said use, people can keep in mind seven plus plus minus two chunks of information. So minimize the memory load by making action object option visible. The person shouldn't have to remember information from one part of the interface to another, and instruction should be visible and easily retrievable whenever appropriate. So these are two examples of recognition. You don't need to type the entire um, string something metered but you have a list and you need to just you need to remember how string compare is written in this specific programming language but you have to recognize it among a list and we also met this about slide about font yesterday um, this apply the same for search so visual studio code for instance allow you to search and to uh, have advanced option in a way that is easy to recognize while um, vi will instead needs you to remember how to search and uh, replace all the occurrences of uh, a specific uh, string of text. So suggestion, avoid codes, use explicit names, uh, avoid extra hurdles, so avoid asking for unnecessary information where you don't need them, and provide preview when possible, so like code completion, page preview as in the printer, order summary just to confirm i'm showing you what you did up, up to this point are you sure you want to continue want to edit etc provide itineraries etc 
flexibility. Accelerator might often speed up the interaction for the expert user so that they can use it faster while not bothering the novice user. So accelerator are like shortcut. Ctrl S, Ctrl C, Ctrl V are all accelerator. You can do the same operation in other way, but if you know the accelerator, the shortcut that is quicker to use. And the keyboard on iOS, you can, in this example, you can write just swiping on the keyboard or you can select letter by letter. And this is another accelerator. And of course, the uh, autocomplete here is also another accelerator. So all these are examples of accelerators that increase flexibility and efficiency of use. Mm. So flexibility is given by default plus options, as I said before also. Um, when possible, exploit background information for providing more information <laughs> to the user. So if you are creating a calendar interface and planning an event, maybe you can provide within the calendar the weather forecast so that the person has the information about the weather for that day when the person is planning for the event. Or the person can ignore it if he wants, uh, but it's, it's still there available. Uh, keep in mind the novice and expert have different needs. Mm -hmm. So you should be able to support proactivity, personalization, and different interaction technique. And of course, preserving the basic functionality for novices and adding, if you want, accelerator for the more expert. Um, you can use the recommendation to give flexibility or to, to have people learn something they didn't know and overall try to provide relevant information only. Aesthetic and minimalistic design. Interface should not contain information that is irrelevant or really need. Every extra unit informa in information competes with the relevant information and diminish the um, visibility of the relevant information. We talked yesterday about colors, etc. This is another example of a violation of that um, of, of that of this heuristic because here there are too many things going on in all the sense, not only in terms of colors but also in terms of text, etc., layout, etc. And this is on the other side, the extreme of the minimalistic design, just a, name, uh, a search field with two buttons and let's see, to get started with the research. Um, suggestion, similar to yesterday, key information must be above the fold, uh, keep high signal to noise, to noise ratio, so contrast in the fonts, colors, etc. Uh, the login experience when available should be minimalistic, uh, accept, if possible, redundant way of entering information. This also gives you flexibility and other the previous heuristics. And prune features that are outside the core functionality in general. So start with the core functionality and then you can think of extending them for adding flexibility, not just because the developer likes it or thinks that it is useful. Help user recognize, diagnose and recover from error. Mm. So when error happens, error message should be expressed in plain language and precisely indicate the problem and provide a, suge a suggestion on how to solve it. So this is a totally useless error message because give me a 404, that is a code that is not understandable by the majority of people, maybe now a little bit more, uh, and not found, say that this page is not found, but doesn't provide suggestion on how to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. So these are, this is, for instance, a better for, for a page in which tells which is the problem. It seems that the page you are trying to find is not here anymore. And you can do two actions, multiple actions. One, report an error. Or if, it's, if you are just coming here by random, you cannot report anything missing. Here there is a list of other articles to read, or you can also browse the, the, the blog just in case you need to look for other similar information on your own. There is way forward. Report, browse. Uh, so make errors easy to identify in terms of colors, fonts, etc. 
make problem clear, the cause, the location of the problems, and provide a solution. Give suggestions, show a path forward, and propose an alternative when possible in case of errors. And finally, 10, help and documentation. Even if it's better for a system to be usable without documentation, sometimes uh, documentation is needed and help is needed. Um, and when it's present, such information should be easy to search, focus on the user task, not on the system language, and least concrete step to be carried out and not to be too large, not to be an encyclopedia. So these are positive examples of documentation, of help and documentation. This is this tutorial, step-by-step -step tutorial on how to use the software. And here there is the video that show how to use the software in addition to your normal usage so that if you need help, you have multiple ways to get information. There is text, there is video, there is other things that you can use for getting information according to your um, usage. Um, the Slack board is another uh, in Slack, the Slack bot is another good thing for helping with documentation. So instead of going to the uh, on the guide on the full documentation, this bot will highlight in this example three starting point for you for your search for your problem. So that if you need help, you have direction to find specific help. And then once you are on the general help website, help documentation, you can get more, read more, etc. So, suggestion also for this, provide example in documentation for complex choice, help the user understand the error gravity, hmm? printing outside the margin as a significant error because you are going to reprint because the printing will not uh, be successful because you are material that will not be printed from the printer. Other things are less maybe um, uh, significant. Uh, provide tips for showing new action steps. Use Popover to point out to changes in the user interface if you change from version 1 to version 2 or in the case of first usage and avoid two packs like term and condition and try to summarize them if possible. This is in general and then of course you can use all the suggestion in a reverse engineering way and so if you are evaluating a user interface according to the heuristic, you can see, okay, here I would need help, but there is example, there is not example, here I would need visibility. I am in a form, I have visibility, there is a clear path forward or not. This could also be used on the reverse to help you um, conduct an heuristic evaluation. Next week, we will do uh, an example and an exercise in which we apply, in which you, will apply these heuristics first to the Trinitalia website that uh, there will be several uh, usability problems on the Trinitalia website uh, and we will use three tasks. Hmm? These are the three tasks reported here because as for every heuristic evaluation you have some task, some action to do on an interface. It's not just free navigation or everything. You have three tasks to do specifically and some uh, issues that we can find and then we will also do an exercise on uh, a paper prototype of um, the 22 version of the course that is closer to what you will need to do um, as part of assignment 3. And assignment 3 will be out this week um, and we will give an overview assignment 3 on Monday. With that, if you have any question, I'm still here for a couple of minutes. Otherwise, see you tomorrow in the feedback session in Sala Colloqui, fourth floor above the Secretariat. And there is the scheduling of groups in Telegram and on the website. So if you haven't noticed that, have a look at it because something has changed with respect to the previous feedback session. Have a nice rest of the day.